Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to talk to you this evening about the origins of the United Synagogue, Kamatsoros, as they say. Um, it's a great pleasure to do so because, as I, as you'll know, I am act. I'm very much a child of the United Synagogue. My grandfather was the shamus of the great synagogue in Duke's Place. My father was for 38 years the chazan of St. Petersburg Place, uh, and I literally grew up within the borders within a house that belonged to the United Synagogue. Let's go first of all then to London in 1690 and Moses Hart. The first Jews, next slide please, the first Jews to come into London were Sephardim, but it wasn't long before there was a whole group of very poor Ashkenazim and by 1690 they had organized themselves into some sort of community and from the beginning, they called it pretty well the Great Synagogue. Uh, the Sephardi community were only too happy to admit Ashkenazim, who had a lot of money, but they didn't want to, in, to admit the Ashkenazim who didn't. So they admitted a man called Benjamin Levy, who was a, an Ashkenazi, but was enormously wealthy. And he was who actually bought the first cemetery for the great synagogue, which is the cemetery in Alderney Road uh, near in Stepney, which the United Synagogue maintains to this day. Um, shortly after, a kinsman of his called Moses Hart arrived from Hamburg. Ha Moses Hart was a merchant. Um, he was became very wealthy. Uh, and right from the beginning, he involved himself in the affairs of the great synagogue. Uh, and more to the point, he and the man who became his son-in-law caused a sensation in 1719 when they bought a ticket on the lottery and won £20,000 at 1719 money. It's a huge amount of money. So he built himself a very luxurious mansion at Isleworth. Next slide. which was so famous that people made this sort of drawing and the print sellers were selling them for profit. At the time, the rabbi of the synagogue was a man called Judah Leib Cohen. He had a problem with one of the Gaboim, whose name was Reb Abedala London, who actually was a rabbi. He had a rabbinical diploma, but he, had a, he was a very successful merchant, mainly by dealing in jewels. Um, and he didn't like the rabbi, so one morning, a burial of London bribed the Shamus to go up behind the rabbi and cut off one of the tzitzit of the rabbi's talit. Um, this not only reflected badly on the rabbi for having an incomplete talit, but those of us who've done Hebra Kadisha work will know that when you prepare a deceased person, deceased Jewish man for burial, you put him in a tallit, but you cut off one of the tzitzit. The omens for Rabbi Judah Leib Cohen were just too bad, and he made a quick exit to become the rabbi of a community in Rotterdam. So they then needed a rabbi. And Moses Hart had a brother, Aaron Hart. Next slide, please. And Aaron Hart was a rabbi, and he became the rabbi of the great synagogue in 1706, and he remained in post, as you will see, for 50 years. At that time, the synagogue appears to have been meeting in a series of rented rooms or perhaps rented buildings. But Moses Hart, having made a great deal of money and won even more on the lottery, decided that it was time that the synagogue should have its own place of worship. Next slide, please. And in 1722, he built at his own expense uh, a synagogue, which cost him, as you will see from this plaque, uh, oh, it doesn't say, it, he actually paid 2,000 pounds. That building was improved somewhat in about 
But at the end of the century, they demolished that building altogether and they erected a brand new synagogue to which Moses Hart's daughter, Judy Levy, who was known as the Queen of Richmond Green, gave the very considerable sum of £4,000. And on the next slide, you will see the picture of the great synagogue in Duke's Place. This is a very famous engraving. Um, I've got a copy of it. It was by an artist called Ackerman, but it said that Rowlandson put in the figures onto the, onto the image. But as we all know, communities usually develop by splitting. And one of the occupational hazards of being a rabbi, there are two occupational hazards which I will come to, but the first one is that you will always find somebody who, uh, the second, that this is the second one. The first is, is you might find a warden who doesn't like you. But the second one is that you'll find a member of the shul who thinks he knows more than you do. And Aaron Hart had such a member in a man called either Menachem Moses or more normally known as Moses Hamburger. On Sunday, the 27th of August, 1706, Aaron Hart did what's called a get al tanai, that is to say a conditional bill of divorce for a man called Asher Anshul Cohen. He was a communal ne'er-do-well. He was going off to the West Indies and he did a, bill, a get al tanai, a conditional bill of divorce in the event that he might not return. And there was a sort of subtext that the family hoped that he probably wouldn't, might not return and his wife would not be an aguna, a chained woman. Moses Hamburger says, no, no, I know he couldn't possibly have done this and I will wager five guineas, he said that afternoon, that he's made a mess of it. This, was, this caused a bit of a row. Aaron Hart is a very peaceful man, goes to Mordechai Hamburger and he says, look, if you'll retract what you said about me, then I will arrange for you to be called up on Rosh Hashanah. Ooh, wah. Not so fast. The warden of the synagogue was this man, Rabbi Berila London, who'd had it in for the previous rabbi. Berila London had it in for Mordechai Hamburger as well, because Berila London had wanted to marry one of the daughters of Gluckel of Hamlin, who was a, who is a well-known Jewish diarist of this period. And the daughter had rejected Berila London and instead had married Mordechai Hamburger, Cherche La Femme, and suddenly, uh, Berla London had the chance to pull one over his old rival. So he rushes back from Hamburg, says to Aaron Hart, don't you dare do anything of the sort. And they put Mordechai Hamburg into harem, into excommunication. That is very serious in Georgian London. So that's Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. And then comes Sukkot. And there was a problem that year because the Ashkenazim had ordered their etrogim from Tangiers, but the winds were contrary and ships couldn't set sail. The Sephardim, who had more sense, had ordered their etrogim from Livorno in Italy. So they came over land. And when the when the etrog arrived at the synagogue. And it was passed around from hand to hand so that people could make the blessing. When it got to Mordechai Hamburger, he was so, no, no, you can't, you're excommunicated. And when his wife shortly afterwards had a child, he was told that they couldn't, she couldn't come to shore to give thanks. And this was just too much. So he split off and he set up a separate community and he set up the Hambro Synagogue. Next slide, please. This is the building of the Hambro Synagogue that was put up in 1725. It appears to be the only photograph of the building, and it's really quite interesting. It's a long, thin building, but look at the seats on the left-hand side. They are at the front of the row, so there's nowhere. If you're sitting there, you've got to hold your books, but behind you, there are book rests. But you could only have used that book rest, those book rests when you were standing. But the Hambro was a very wealthy community. Next slide. 
in the Jewish Museum, there is this Sefer Torah mantle that belonged to the Hambro Synagogue. Next slide. Next. No. Look, it's got the most beautiful detailing a picture of an ark. It's amazing. The problem is this, that it's not sewn with cotton thread. It's sewn with wire. And it is so heavy that it takes two men to lift that safe Torah mantle. So whether they were ever able to use it, I doubt it. But this was a congregation that had money. Next slide. This is the Chanukiah that belonged to the Hamburg, which is in the Jewish Museum. Look at that beautiful barley sugar work on the stem of the brass Chanukiah. And if you look at the next slide, Nick. This is a reading desk that belonged to the Hambro, uh, which I arranged to have put into the New West End. Uh, and it's really, it's really rather beautiful. This was a community that had a lot of money. The next split came in 1761. There was a group of members of the Great Synagogue who complained that they weren't being called up often enough. One of the things about Georgian synagogue rows is that the people may be different and the venues may be different, but the rows are entirely recognizable. And a whole group of members of the great synagogue broke away and decided to form their own community. And they bought a livery hall from the worshipful company of tilers and bricklayers in Leadenhall Street. And they converted the upstairs into the synagogue, although the livery company retained the wine cellars below, which gave rise to the, to the rhyme. The spirits above are spirits divine, but the spirits below are spirits of wine. And they used this building until 1837. And in 1837, they moved to their next building in Great St. Helens magnificent wealthy beautiful building and if you look at the next slide which is a close-up you'll see on the right it was Sukkot and there's a gentleman who's got his talit draped over his arms rather like rather like a stole who's carrying a really savage looking lulav and if this shul seems familiar to people then if you look at the next slide that's the Ark in Egerton Road, which is where the new synagogue moved in 1915, and they basically reproduced it. But what happened to the 1751 furniture? Next slide. In 1839, the synagogue in Cheltenham, where I've been many times, the most beautiful building, the synagogue in Cheltenham was built, and the new synagogue gave them the furniture for which Cheltenham had to pay the enormous sum of 86 pounds to have it transported to Cheltenham. And if you look at the next slide, that's what the 1751 furniture of the new synagogue looks at like. It's still in use. Next slide. There are only two little windows by the art, but when you daven on that bim and I've had the privilege of doing so many times the light pours in from that great pretty clear story above and also if you look at the at the seating this this is the original seating the cushions i think are new but the backs of the seats are rattan they are genuine georgian seating but there's something even stranger in that shul next slide on the wall there is this prayer for the royal family it's painted in gold on a black background on canvas. It's quite, it says slightly unusual wording because it just says Queen Victoria and all the royal family. But when they restored this about 25 years ago, behind Queen Victoria, they found George IV. Behind George IV was George III and behind him was George II. King George II came to the throne in 1727, but stamped onto the back of the frame 
is the name of the manufacturer who was a firm called Cole and King who went out of business in 1730. This therefore must have been produced not for the new synagogue but for the original building of the great synagogue and it's the oldest Ashkenazi synagogue artifact anywhere in the UK. Now let's come back to the great synagogue. Aaron Hart died in 1760, 1756 uh, and they needed somebody to succeed him and they took Hart Lyon, who or his real name was Herschel Levin, but he was anglicized to Hart Lyon and he was the rabbi of the great synagogue from 1758 to 1764. Um, he was a considerable scholar but he complained, had a lot of complaints. He claimed, he complained that the women came to shul in dresses that were too low cut, that there was too much aping of non-Jewish customs, that some of the Jews even ate Christmas pudding. There was lax observance of morals and people didn't come to synagogue. The fact that his sermons when he gave them and probably only twice a year lasted at least one and a half hours might have had something to do with it. At this time also, the great synagogue has to deal with some local problems. So women are asked not to come in crinolines because there isn't enough room in the ladies gallery. And men are told that they can wear swords to shul on Shabbat, provided that the swords have wooden blades. A wooden blade could do quite a lot of damage and would defend you. In 1764, Hart Lyon resigned. He is the only rabbi of the great synagogue from Aaron Hart up to and including Joseph Herman Hertz, who did not die in office. He resigned and he went to Mannheim and then Berlin. And there was then a problem. The two of the synagogues, the Hambro and the New, appointed a man called Meshulam Zalman as their chief rabbi. But the great synagogue, uh, next slide, appointed David Tevela Schiff. Schiff was, and he was the rabbi of the great synagogue. He consecrated the building in the 1760s. He served in the first building. He consecrated the second building and he consecrated the 1790 building as well. He was a scurry man. Um, he, and he, he bemoaned the lack of intellectual stimulation. Um, his daughter and his wife's cousin became, who became his daughter-in-law ran the household except that we know that he kept control of two things one was the ordering of white nightcaps from Hamburg and the other was the ordering of handkerchiefs that had to be colored because he was addicted to snuff there was a dispute in Portsmouth which at the time was the largest of the provincial communities as to who should be chief rabbi would it be Meshulam Salman of the Hambro and the New, or would it be David Tevela Schiff of the Great? And Portsmouth actually split over this issue and created two shuls. But the old wardens of the older shul decided that they wished to be under the authority of Rabbi Schiff and the Great Synagogue, and they came to London and they arranged things, including the liability to send the great synagogue every year five pounds of wax to be used for the manufacture of candles for Yom Kippur. Um, Meshulam Zalman in the end had to leave after the American Civil, uh, the American War of Independence. There was a major recession in England. The shul couldn't afford Meshulam Solomon's uh, salary and in any case he had a very public and rather nasty divorce from what the papers described as the Jew priestess and he went back to Hamburg and henceforth the rabbi of the great synagogue who would soon begin to bear the title of the chief rabbi held undisputed sway over London, over the kingdom and in due course most of the empire. When Schiff died in 1791 there was then an interregnum for about 10 years until Solomon Herschel who is the next slide 
became the rabbi of the great synagogue in 1802, and he was in post for 40 years. Uh, there is a colored portrait of him in the National Portrait Gallery, but this is something that I copied from a Yom Kippur Machzer that I own, dated 1806, which has unusually has inside it as its frontispiece a picture of the rabbi. It's, you don't get pictures of living people in Machzerim. Why did the printer put it there? Well, there was a row, there were two conflicting versions of the Machsa going around London, and Herschel approved one particular version, so the printer put his picture in the front of the Machsa. The other printer, whose version had not been approved, got his own back by issuing a Chumash in little bits, one sedra a week at a time, and he gave these to the members of the great synagogue and they were wrapped in the pieces of paper in which he printed the most terrible scurrilous attacks on Solomon Herschel, some of which are very funny. There's a very large set of them in the library of the London School of Jewish Studies. Herschel was the actually the first chief rabbi to have been born in England. He was born in London when his father, who was Hart Lyon, he was Hart Lyon's son. His father was the rabbi between 1758 and 64. Solomon Herschel was the last of the old of the old fashioned rabbis of the great synagogue. When he preached, it was very rarely and in Yiddish. The only sermon he is known to have delivered in English was the eulogy for Nathan Mayer Rothschild in 1836. And that almost certainly was written in German or Yiddish and translated into English for him. When he died in 1842, he was a surprisingly wealthy man. We know that he liked, had a lot of knowledge of mathematics because we've got some mathematical textbooks with his annotations on them, and it's believed that he pay, played the stock exchange. And he left about £40,000 in 1842, which was a great deal of money. But the community, by this time, is becoming very English. The effect of the French Revolution and the Napoleonic Wars meant that immigration into England had stopped for about 25 years and by the middle of the 19th century most English Jews were second or third generation English born. They were citizens of the state. The only legal di disabilities that Jews suffered were the disabilities suffered by anybody who wasn't a member of the Cath of the Anglican Church. London was the largest city in Europe. The wars in Europe had led to the development of the financial markets. And by 1815, Rothschilds were the, was the largest bank in the world. Jewish population soon after Waterloo was about 25,000. Two thirds of them lived in London, which is the way that it's pretty well always been. And the rest in a large number of provincial communities only a handful had over a thousand people and many had less than a hundred people. Most of the Jews were in ports because the big Jewish business at the time was supplying ships. It was ships chandlery it's by Portsmouth, Plymouth, our big cities and so is Liverpool. And the demographic, demographic, demographic face of anglo jury is changing. The traditional itinerant Jewish peddler, old clothes men, orange and lemon sellers, had given way to middle-class artisans, shopkeepers, professionals, who were indistinguishable from other middle-class members. And at this stage, next slide, a man called Levi Barrent Cohen comes to London. He was a linen draper, He'd come from Holland about 1775, and when his wife Fanny died, he married her sister Lydia, and between the two of them, he fathered 12 daughters and seven sons, and was known as the purveyor of wives to the young Jewish gentlemen of London. Among his sons-in-law were both Moses Montefiore, next slide, and next slide, Nathan Mayer Rothschild. Moses Montefiore married Jewish Judith Cohen and Nathan Mayer married Hannah Cohen. Nathan Mayer was 
one of the five brothers who'd come from Frankfurt. Uh, he made the for some fortunes by astute trading on the exchange. It said that he knew about the victory of Waterloo before the British government did, so sold a large number of British securities. Um, and just before the news came to London, bought a huge number of them at a knockdown price. The Rothschilds please say that this story isn't true. Um, Nathan Mayer was an affable man. He spoke with a heavy German accent. He believed in the civic rights of Jews, but it was going to be his son, Baron Lionel, next slide, who was English born and English educated, who became the standard bearer of the of emancipation. The problem at the time was that Jews, although they could go into pretty well any office in English civic life, could not become members of parliament because there, the oath for an MP included the words on the true faith of a Christian. It was a sort of hangover from the Jacobite rebellion, for want of a better description. Lionel de Rothschild was elected as MP by the City of London in 1847, in 1849, in 1852, in 1857, and again in 1857. And on each of these occasions, he was unable to take his seat because of this phrase upon the true faith of a Christian. Finally, in the summer of 1858, because of problems with London's sewage, the House of Commons became uninhabitable. The trouble was the Thames was virtually stagnant and the development of sanitary plumbing had caused all sorts of sewage to go into the Thames and the place stank. And there's no doubt whatever that the House of Lords, who were the people who were blocking Jewish emancipation, came to the conclusion that they needed to go home and get away from the smell and let the Jews have their have their rights. And therefore, finally, next slide, on the 26th of July, 1858, Lionel de Rothschild takes his seat as a member of parliament. As he came to take his seat on the benches on the left-hand side, which was the liberal benches, the, his friend Benjamin Disraeli, who you will see is the front character on the right hand side of the picture. And Disraeli had risked his political career many times for Rothschild. Disraeli walked across the bar of the house and the two men shook hands. It was for England a great occasion in religion, religious uh, toleration. For the Jews, it was in a very real sense, the end of the Middle Ages. Now let's look at the next slide and we'll see who was chief rabbi. Nathan Marcus Ardley is one of the first of the modern chief rabbis. He wasn't appointed only by the great synagogue. He was appointed by the city synagogue, three city synagogues and quite a number of provincial ones as well. He was university educated. He had been born in Hanover, so he was to an extent a British subject. He had been the rabbi of Hanover, where he had made a very favorable impression on the Duke of Cambridge. He was a Ger Ger German intellectual, and he became a friend of Albert, the Prince Consort, with whom he would discuss German aspects of German aspects of German literature in German. The Prince Consort liked talking to Rabbi Adler when he was getting a tough time from Victoria. At the same time, there's a move out of the city um, towards the West End, Fitzrovia, Mayfair, Bayswater, St. John's Wood. And it's necessary to cater for those new areas. Most of the shuls in the city of London, including Bevis Marks, tried to stop synagogues opening in other parts of London because they were afraid that they would lose income. It's the usual problem of inner city synagogues. And Bevis Marks actually forbade a group of gentlemen to form a synagogue in, the, in Margaret Street, just off Hanover Square, just off um, Cavendish Square. But they weren't having any and they broke away and they formed the Society of Margaret Street, which eventually became 
the West London Synagogue of British Jews, which is the founding congregation of British Reform Judaism. And the name of that synagogue is very significant. It is the West London. In other words, we're having nothing to do with the city of London and with British Jews that has to do with the emancipation problem. The Ashkenazi community realized that if they didn't do something for the people in the West End, they also might have a breakaway. So <coughs> they formed a branch synagogue in Portland Street and called it the Central Synagogue. And when the Central was consecrated on the 29th of March, 1855, an announcement was made from the pulpit as follows. Notice is hereby given that this building now about to be consecrated is a branch of the great synagogue situated in Duke's Place in the parish of St. James Aldgate in the city of London. It was, in other words, merely a branch of Duke's Place. And if you look at the next slide, you'll see this was the central synagogue building. Uh, the building that they opened in 1870. And the next slide has a beautiful close up of the Ark. It really was quite a magnificent, magnificent structure. This, however, didn't meet the requirements of all the Jews who were settling in the western suburb. And therefore, another synagogue was opened at Bayswater, but this was a joint venture of the Great Synagogue and the New Synagogue. And on the 30th of July, 1863, next slide, a new synagogue was consecrated in Chichester Place, Bayswater. If you look at the next slide, which is the interior, that's what it looked like when it was opened. And the next slide is a close up of the ark. Uh, and to the right of it, there is the chief rabbi's chair. It was a beautiful synagogue. I took the service on a number of Shabbat mornings when Chazan Dubina was away. Um, the problem is, of course, if you put this, once you put the Sefer Torah in, it was difficult to sing because you were almost in that hollow. Why is there a chief rabbi's chair? Well, the first minister of the Bayswater Synagogue was Herman Adler, son of Chief Rabbi Nathan Marcus Adler, and in due course to be Chief Rabbi himself. He was a very successful minister of the shul and his congregation loved him. There's a marvelous story that one lady once went to the Reverend A.L. Green, who was the minister of the Central Synagogue in Great Portland Street, and asked him if he would please visit her husband who was seriously ill with cholera, which is a very contagious disease. Madam, he said, are you not members of the Bayswater Synagogue? Oh, yes, she replied. But I couldn't possibly ask dear Dr. Herman to risk his life in this way. Um, the central synagogue had been very much under the control of the great. It didn't even appoint its own wardens. They were appointed for it by the great synagogue. Bayswater, being a, fun, uh, a joint venture of two shuls, had its own autonomy. It dealt with its own finances. It appointed its own wardens and in due course it actually got the right to carry out weddings. But by this time there were already moves to unite the synagogues. In 1804 there had been a joint Shekita which included the Sephardi community and the provision of Matzot. There had been arrangements for poor relief. Uh, in the Treaty of 1834 provided for the financing of various communal responsibilities among the congregations and also made it very difficult for members of one synagogue to join another. Because Lionel de Rothschild became an MP in 1858, the three city synagogues came together to form the Jewish Board of Guardians and the moving spirit in this arrangement, next slide, was a man called Lionel Louis Cohen. Lionel Louis Cohen was the great grandson of Levi Baron Cohen. Um, his earliest recollection of doing something in the community was as a boy of 13 holding the chuppah at the induction 
of Chief Rabbi Nathan Marcus Adler. Um, up to the middle of the 19th century, synagogue had looked after its own poor, but in the euphoria following 1858, Lionel Louis Cohen, who was then only in his, th in his late 20s, he must have been a very, very powerful char character, persuaded the members of the three city synagogues to get together and to form a Jewish board of guardians to deal with Jewish poor. Jewish board of guardians, of course, is today called Jewish care. And it is, or it certainly used to be, the 10th largest charity in the United Kingdom. Lionel Louis Cohen was honorary secretary and subsequently president, but his role actually was rather more akin to being chief executive. So the, there were the advantages of communal wide cooperation, but at the same time, there was something called shulism. There was a tendency for each community to act without talking to the others. And there were some disputes between the new synagogue and the great synagogue. When the new synagogue accused the great synagogue of pinching its members, some member of the new wanted to have his son's bar mitzvah at the great and was told that he couldn't do it. So he politely went back and had his simcha at the new synagogue. Somebody else wanted to have his son's bar mitzvah in the central synagogue, which is a branch of the great synagogue, and was told that he couldn't do that either. And at that stage, he told the new synagogue in fairly blunt terms that he would belong to whichever synagogue he damn well wanted to. And this is something called shulism. So something had to be done. So that on Monday, the 24th of September, 1866, which was the first day of Sukkot, Chief Rabbi Nathan Marcus Ardle invited the wardens of the great, the Hamber and the new to have breakfast with him in his sukkah. And at this meal, he suggested that there should be a union of the three Ashkenazi shuls in the city and their two branches at Central and Bayswater. This appealed very strongly to Lionel Cohen's sense of order, and he became the moving spirit in the conference of delegates. He also worked closely with a man, next slide, called Asher Asher. Dr. Asher Asher was a Scot. He was the first Scottish Jew to be a qualified qualify as a doctor. Uh, and after practice in Glasgow, he came to London in 1862 to become the medical officer for the board of guardian for the Jewish board of guardians. And that's when he got undoubtedly got to know Lionel Louis Cohen. And the two of them worked very well together. Uh, Cohen worked very hard. It was by no means unknown for him to leave a meeting at 11 p.m. and to forward seven, several pages of handwritten notes by the first post the following morning. Lionel Cohen and Asher Asher worked very hard on this idea of the union of, this, of the three synagogues. And it also helped by the fact that uh, Asher Asher became the secretary of the great synagogue in 1866. He appears to have largely given up medical practice. He was, it must have been a very erudite man because some of the correspondence that we have from him is written in Hebrew and actually his application in due course to become the secretary of the United Synagogue was submitted in Hebrew as well as in English. I don't think that's ever happened since then. Eventually, after a great deal of very difficult negotiation, because every synagogue had to agree every full stop, it was all agreed that they went to the charity commissioners. It then had to be put into a form that could be presented to Parliament. And that took about another year and a half. And again, every full stop had to be agreed by all the three synagogues. And then it went to the Home Secretary. This is in Gladstone's first ministry. One of the things that they did in Gladstone's first ministry was that they disestablished the Anglican Church in Ireland because of all sorts of reasons which were correct. The original document for the United Synagogue said there shall be the chief rabbi. And the Home Secretary at the time found it difficult 
that whereas on the one hand in Ireland he was removing secular support for an ecclesiastical institution, he didn't think that in an act of parliament or a schema next to an act of parliament, he could give secular support to a different religious institution. So it had to be altered and it had to say a chief rabbi and a whole lot of clauses that had to be taken out of the scheme because of that were put into something called with the deed of trust. Finally, it went to Parliament and next slide on the 14th of July 1870, it became law. This is the copy that the United Synagogue got from Parliament and you will see in the top right hand corner, handwritten in Norman French, the words La Reine Le Volte, the Queen wants it, which is the inscription by which an act of Parliament passes into law. When the United Synagogue Act was passed, Lionel Cohen became the vice president because the presidency in those days was a sinecure largely held by Rothschild and had to remain that until the death of Lionel de Rothschild in 1942. And Lionel Louis Cohen was the moving spirit and the mastermind. And they, he and Asher Asher really drafted the bylaws and gave the institution a lot of its current form. To begin with, they were very concerned about finances and each community was asked to send a representative to the finance committee. That is why in United Synagogues, the treasurer has, or certainly used to have, the very curious title of financial representative. Finance at times seemed to be almost more important than anything else. In his book, The Children of the Ghetto, Israel Zangwill put into the mouth of one of the his characters the following. I have always maintained that the United Synagogue could be run as a joint stock company for the sake of a dividend and that there wouldn't be an atom of difference in the discussions if the councillors were directors. Finance fascinates them. Long after Judaism has ceased to exist, excellent gentlemen will be found regulating its finances. One of the major purposes of the foundation of the United Synagogue was the development of additional communities. And in the first 20 years, seven new communities joined the union. Next slide. The first community to join was the Borough Synagogue. This was an existing community. It had been formed in 1867 and it joined the Union in 1873 after a lot of negotiation about its outstanding debts. At this time stage, Bayswater is already too small for its community. There's discussion about extending Bayswater, but in due course it was decided that it would be better to create two additional synagogues in the area. Next slide. The first of these was the St. John's Wood Synagogue in Abbey Road. The community was consecrated in 1876 and this building was put up in 1881. And the interior, next slide, is really rather beautiful. Of all the synagogues that were being put up, the most problematic was the East London Synagogue in Rectory Square. This was the United Synagogue's eastern outpost in the heart of what was becoming an immigrant area. Next slide. The shul opened in 1877. Beautiful building. Um, it really was quite, quite amazing. And one of the attractions for the immigrant community was that it offered weddings at a much lower fee than the city synagogues charged. It became Lionel Louis Cohen's particular concern and he frequently rode on horseback from his home north of Hyde Park to Rectory Square with Tullis and Tefillin in his saddlebag to join the congregation at Shachrit during the week, after which he went on to the bank in Throgmorton Street where he was the senior partner. Next slide. Then there is the North London Synagogue in Lofting Road. This had 
been put up in 1865 and actually the great synagogue had lent them a thousand pounds towards the cost of the building but it remained independent until they saw the virtue of joining the union and in 1878 they joined the they joined the union and next slide there's a beautiful picture of the inside of the synagogue a wedding in the synagogue i find find this very interesting because this is where my parents were married in march 1939 but the next picture of lofting road the north london synagogue is actually very interesting this was taken at sukkot the chazan is a very famous man called reverend chaim Vasatsuk. But you'll see that only the chazan and the three honorary officers have a lul of an etrog. And of the three honorary officers, really only the left-hand guy knows what he's doing. This used to be what went on in the United Synagogue. When I was a kid in the New West End Synagogue, the shul bought a number of lulovim and etrogim and the wardens would direct the shamas to take them to certain individual members who had the honor of shaking them during Hallel. It's an interesting uh, picture of what went on in the United Synagogue in those days. The next synagogue that was built was the New West End. This was formed in 1879. The moving spirit was Samuel Montague, the first Lord Swathling. It was built in 1879. This is the next slide is the interior. Looking towards the ark. Uh, and the next slide is looking towards the bimmer. This is the shul I grew up in. I was three and a half when I came into this synagogue. And every time I go, come in there, I still expect to see my father on the bimmer. Um, he had a very good friend uh, across the road, the vicar of St. Matthews Bayswater and on one occasion Richard Yale the vicar said Rayful I came looking for you and I came into the synagogue but you were on the bridge the next synagogue was uh, the Dalton synagogue next slide in Poets Road which was formed in 1885 Poets Road the 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 uh, promoters of the shul had first come to the United Synagogue in 1881 and were turned away politely and were told that they didn't have things properly organized and they weren't big enough and how were they going to pay for it anyway but in 1885 it opened and the last one to join the union up to 1890 was the hammersmith synagogue i've taken an artificial stop at 1890 for this for this talk now let's look at some of the some of the music next slide J.L. Mombach had come to the Great Synagogue in 1827 as what was called a Mishorer. In those days, there were no shul choirs, and the chazan had a tenor and a bass standing alongside him who freely harmonized. He was the Mishorer, but when a choir was formed in 1841-42, he became the choir master of the Great and in due course also of the new synagogue, and a lot of what we sing in Anglo Jury was written by him. For instance, La Doshem Ha Rezum is Mombach. Baruch Haba, which many of us have got married to, is Mombach, although he didn't write it for the wedding ceremony. In those days, the elections for the uh, great synagogue took place on Hoshana Rabba. The results were announced on Shemini Atzeret, and two weeks later, a formal procession of the new honorary officers entered the great synagogue to music composed by Mombach. Then there were other choir masters, and the leading one, next slide, was D.M. Davis. Davis was appointed choir master of the New Western Synagogue in 1879 and stayed in office until 1930. He wrote quite a lot of music uh, that, again, a lot of us have got married to. Hallelujah, hallelujah, is D.M. Davis. Uh, and in 1899, Davis, together with Rabbi Francis Cohen, produced the Manual of Synagogue Music, which is officially called Kol Rinavatodah, 
but in practice that is known to everybody as the Blue Book until some years ago somebody in the United Synagogue produced a new version of it and had it bound in black. Now let's look at prayer books. This is the Reverend Simeon Singer. He actually had a rabbinical diploma and sometimes he sat as a dayan on the Beth Din, but he uh, never used his title rabbi. He was always known as the Reverend. Let me just say something about titles and clerical collars. Um, it was the aim of the community to be seen as members of England and they were very proud of the fact that Judaism in late Victorian Britain had become a socially acceptable religion. That's why their clergymen were called the reverend and not rabbi. That's why their clergymen wore clerical collars which actually have nothing to do with the clergy but is just a fashion that that remained just as Dionym and senior rabbis wear frock coats that nobody else wears these days. So the clergy continued to wear the collar style of the mid 19th century, except that interestingly, Singer here seems to be wearing a white bow tie. And they're not wearing kippot because that was something that really only came into Anglo Jewry after the Second World War. If you look at the history of the Avigda, of the, the Schoenfeld schools, uh, it says that when Avigda Schoenfeld founded the schools, the boys had to wear kippot for praying, for eating, and for limade Kurdish, but otherwise did not wear them. The idea you wear kippah all the time is a relatively modern development. In due course, um, Chief Rabbi Nathan Marcus Ardell asked him to produce a singer, a standard prayer book, next one. And he produced the authorized daily prayer book. Sidurim don't have to be authorized. But this was authorized because the Book of Common Prayer is authorized. And it's this size and this color because this is what the Book of Common Prayer and the Anglican churches looked like. In other words, this is what an Englishman's prayer book looked like at the end of the 19th century. The inside was different, but the outside had to look the same. And if you look at the title page, which is the next slide of the first issue, You'll see that on the left, he is described as the Reverend Essinger, and on the right, it says, Hey Kuf Shimon, which I suppose means Hakadosh. When I did the fourth edition of the Singer's Prayer Book, the green edition, I kept the same idea. In Hebrew, it says Harav. In English, it says the Reverend. And he was the first man to have the custom of giving a, an address to Hosn and Kala under the chuppah. Next one. And he was the first person to give a siddur to a bar mitzvah boy and this is uh, a siddur that i have it seems to have been the last siddur that he presented in from the 5th of may 1906 which was probably the last bar mitzvah boy he ever addressed because he died a month or so later and this is the inscription in simeon singer's handwriting so what happened to the synagogues that were uh in part in the original grouping and we'll run through these fairly quickly great synagogue was bombed on the 11th of may 1941 next slide uh, that's that's an, a better view of it that uh that david newman gave me just before I, we we went online uh the next one is the Hambro. It closed in 1893 and they opened a new building in 1899, which had a gentle, a section of the gallery was available for men and it had this very peculiar looking setup. You'd walk up at the end of the shore to get to the gallery, but that closed in 1936 and the Hambro reunited back with the great. Next one, the new synagogue moved to Egerton Road in Stamford Hill in 1915 but eventually it was sold to the Bob of a Hasidim and this is what it looks like now there are tables and chairs instead of seating and the the new synagogue when it was the United Synagogue never had a machitza that high next slide central synagogue was bombed 10th of May 1941 
Uh, they used various premises until in 1958 it was rebuilt to its present building. Next slide is the Bayswater Synagogue, which was demolished in 1970 to make way for the Westway motorway. Next slide is the Borough Synagogue, which closed in 1961. The next slide is the St. John's Wood Synagogue in Abbey Road. Uh, when the St. John's Wood moved into its new building in 1964, this was sold to E. Alec Coleman, the property developer, who was going to pull it down and turn it into flats. Just at that start stage, there was the Jacobs controversy, and they bought the building from Coleman as a ready-made synagogue, and it's now the New London Masorti Synagogue. Next slide, Dalston. Oh, next slide, the East London Synagogue. The East London Synagogue was closed in 1993 and converted into flats, but that's, but that's the inside. They've obviously maintained the arc area somehow or other in the building. Next slide. North London Synagogue which was demolished, closed and demolished in 1958. Next slide. Dalston, which was closed in 1967 and demolished. But you'll see from the next slide that something remains. This is Professor David Newman, whose father was Rabbi Isaac Newman, the last row of the shul, standing in front of what remains of Dalston Synagogue in Poets Road, just a pillar and a little bit of the retaining wall. Next slide is the Hammersmith Synagogue, which closed in 1990 and is now a church. And the next slide is the New West End Synagogue. It is still in its original building. It is still functioning in its original building. And the building is still a synagogue and it is now grade one listed. Next slide. Can I just talk briefly about sources? The two wonderful books for this sort of thing are the late Peter Renton's book on the Lost Synagogues of London, which has got the most amazing photograph. And happily with us, Professor Aubrey Newman's book on the United Synagogue, 1870s, 1970. That's my copy and you will see it has been very well used. And I also want to mention that some of these slides came from the Jewish Museum and a number of these slides were provided to me by my friend, Professor David Newman. Next slide. Asher Asher and Lionel Louis Cohen. Asher Asher was on very close terms with the Rothschilds. He was to a certain extent their charitable advisor. The unofficial almond at one stage, stage it is said that there was a box a basket with his name on in the Rothschild Bank into which all requests for charitable help were dropped for him to consider and advise them. He traveled a great deal. He went to the Holy Land because he was worried about the state of the Jews in Jerusalem. He went to Russia because of the beginning of the big immigration from Russia. He went to the United States, but he wore himself out and he died quite young in the late in uh, 1886. Lionel Louis Cohen had rejected an invitation to stand for parliament in 1874 on the grounds that he needed to devote his time to the Board of Guardians in the United Synagogue. But in 1885, he was elected as the conservative MP for Paddington North. But shortly afterwards, his final illness began and he died in June, 1887. The other vice president of the United Synagogue at the time was a man called Sir Helbert Barrow Ellis, and he had died abroad a few days earlier, and the two vice presidents were buried at Wilson Cemetery on the same afternoon. Known affectionately as King Lionel, Lionel Louis Cohen's gruff manner covered an unswerving integrity and great ability. Two of the major changes that occurred in Anglo-Jury in 
in late Victorian times, the Board of Guardians and the United Synagogue were largely his idea and his creation, and they've shaped the community to this day. At the end of the last report leading to the formation of the United Synagogue, Lionel Louis Cohen wrote, the delegates are convinced that union is strength and that though each congregation can no more shine as a minor constellation, combined they can and will diffuse light and warmth in a degree formerly impossible among the community. The delegates pray almighty God to cause his countenance ever to shine upon his congregation and to vouch to them and to all Israel peace in their religious and social life. Next slide. Lionel Louis Cohen can hardly have foreseen how the United Synagogue, which he founded, has developed in the last 150 years, but he would undoubtedly have approved. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for listening to me. Elkin, thank you so much for an absolutely riveting talk on the history of the United Synagogue. And um, I was struck by, we saw a ceremony some months ago, VE Day, from the New West End Synagogue by my distinguished colleague, Rabbi Moshe Friedman. And um, he certainly took a huge pride in, in the location of that ceremony, as well he should. And so I was struck at the end. Yes, a lot of sadly closed, but I'm struck by the verse we say every time we take out the Sefer Torah, by Hebrew Saha Ha'aron, the ark travels. We Jews travel, and where we travel, the ark goes with us. And so we have traveled, but in so doing, the United Synagogue has actually grown, and it's grown from success to success. And as you have beautifully illustrated this evening, on behalf of everyone listening, thank you so much. And I wish everyone a good evening and stay safe.